Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. May I have your attention? My name is Alexander Messman. Uh, I'm the Executive Vice President of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council. Welcome to our program this afternoon with the Foreign Minister of the Republic of China, Taiwan, Dr. Joseph Wu. And before I introduce our speaker, I want to welcome a few special guests. Accompanying the Foreign Minister is his wife, Madame Wu. Thank you, Madame Wu, for being with us this afternoon. Welcome to Ambassador Abraham Chu, the Director General of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in Los Angeles. Thank you, Ambassador Chu, for arranging the visit of the Foreign Minister in Los Angeles and with the Council. Next, a welcome to members of the Consular Corps. We have the Consul General, Linda Lewis Brown of Belize here. The Honorary Consul, Cadrian Emmanuel Gill of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. <laughs> Consul General Jose Barrelas Trenard of Guatemala. <laughs> Consul General Pablo Mario Ordonez Guzman of Honduras. and Consul General Akira Chiba of Japan, and Deputy Consul General Insang Huang of South Korea. Also here with us today is Dr. Rafiq Dosani, Director at RAND of the Center for Asian Pacific Policy, and Professor Clayton Duby, Director at UC, of the U.S. China Institute. And uh, finally, a thank you to the general manager of the Biltmore Hotel, Jimmy Wu, who pulled out all the stops to make this luncheon event special. Our speaker today, Dr. Joseph Wu, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of China, Taiwan. Um, uh, we have a short biography on the table, so I really won't repeat this, what's written on there, so I refer you to it. Um, but ever since uh, Taiwan transitioned uh, to a vibrant democracy in the 1990s, the council had been fortunate to receive periodic updates of the Taiwanese-United States relationship from senior members of the Taiwanese government. Dr. Wu is the fourth foreign minister from Taiwan who is speaking at the World Affairs Council. Exactly six years ago, to the day, the then Foreign Minister, David Lin, spoke at the Council. This was in 2013, during the Obama administration, at a time when the United States was rebalancing its military and diplomatic focus to Asia, and it was called the Pivot to Asia. Foreign Minister Lin spoke of the strong and close political, economic, and military partnership between the United States and Taiwan, based on shared values of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. Forward to today, ties between both countries are still strong. In March 2018, President Trump signed the Taiwan Travel Act into law, which allows high-level senior government officials of the United States to visit Taiwan and vice versa. High-level visits have since taken place, but more work still needs to be redone. However, Professor Trump, uh, uh, President Trump's foreign policy uh, priority is not based on shared values, but on self-interest and transactional arrangements. And looming over the U.S.-Taiwanese relationship is the People's Republic of China, an ascending power not just in Asia, but globally. What is the current state of the relationship between China, uh, Taiwan and the United States? What are the strategic foreign policy goals of the Taiwanese government? To answer these questions and more, 
please welcome the Foreign Minister of the Republic of Taiwan, His Excellency Dr. Joseph Wu. Appreciate it very much for the introduction, Alex. Uh, members of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council, uh, members of the Diplomatic Corps, distinguished guests and friends from California, Zimbabwe. <laughs> this is a very traditional Taiwanese way of saying hello, and literally, that means have you eaten enough yet? <laughs> uh, it's a true delight for me to be back to Los Angeles, the city I fondly remember for taking my family for a drive along the breathtaking Pacific Coast Highway and going into an in and out for <laughs> a burger. All those fun stuff uh, that I don't have the luxury to do anymore after becoming the foreign minister. I would like to thank the Council for inviting me to speak today. For more than half a century, the Council has dedicated itself to promoting dialogue on global issues. Your slogan, Conversations Matter, resonates deeply within my heart, for I also believe that as long as we are able to sit down and talk to one another, we can promote friendship and partnership. Therefore, I'm honored to take this opportunity to share with you the story of the 23 million people in the democratic Taiwan, our 40-year rock-solid partnership with the United States, and Taiwan's role as a force for good in the Indo-Pacific and beyond. I stand before the World Affairs Council today remembering President Reagan's 1988 speech at the Council, where he called for a worldwide crusade for freedom and democracy, and he cited Taiwan in an array of economic miracles that bore fruit thanks to the advocacy of freedom. President Reagan's remarks still rings true today, now more than ever. The people of Taiwan endured 38 painful years of martial law, but we never gave up on our pursuit for freedom and democracy. Through the efforts of many of those who sacrificed for the civil liberties and freedom, Taiwan has moved out of that dark history and blossomed into a full-fledged democracy, the only democracy amongst the Chinese-speaking societies. As Vice President Mike Pence remarked in October last year, Taiwan's embrace of democracy shows a better path for all the Chinese people and we are absolutely committed to defending and strengthening this democracy and ensuring that our democracy remains resilient. The people of Taiwan are rightfully proud that today, Taiwan is consistently ranked as one of the freest and most democratic countries in the world by international organizations such as Freedom House, Human Rights Watch, and Reporters Without Borders. Taiwan maintains a robust civil society, one that has the capacity to contribute to pressing international issues around the world. And Taiwan maintains a free and open economy, having achieved its best ever ranking of 10th out of 180 countries, according to the Heritage Foundation's Economic Freedom Index, which came out uh, very recently. We will not be shy. If you want to take Taiwan as a role model, for other countries to emulate. But we know that we cannot take the accomplishments for granted. Looking around, rising authoritarian regimes and growing illiberal populist movements on the horizon have clouded over global freedom in recent years. We live in the fraught times. The US national security strategy has stated that revisionist powers use technology propaganda, and coercion to reshape a world antithetical to our interests and values. 
The alarming trends remind us of the importance of safeguarding Taiwan, given our position on the front lines against the marching armies of authoritarianism. For it is true, Taiwan is the first line of defense in an ideological battle that is taking place in Australia, Japan, the United States, Europe, and like-minded societies all over the world. We have the brunt of China's intensified campaign to subvert Taiwan's democracy every day. It, by military intimidation, economic coercion, diplomatic assaults, disinformation, and political subversion that seeks to undermine our elected governments and interfere with our elections. At the beginning of this year, China's President Xi Jinping delivered a speech aiming at Taiwan on January 2nd, touting unification with one country, two system model, which is recognized around the world as having corroded Hong Kong's civil liberties, political rights, and the rule of law. And contrary to the earlier promises to win the hearts and minds of the Taiwanese people, she also blatantly declared to make no promise to abandon the use of force and retain the option of taking all necessary measures. These heartline comments, coupled with their recent efforts in international legal warfare to alter Taiwan's status into a province of China, as well as their renewed military exercises in our surrounding waters, continue to destabilize Taiwan Strait and threaten the region. Their actions are testing the resolves of not only the people of Taiwan, but like-minded partners that have a stake in the regional peace and stability. When the Chinese leaders no longer hide their intentions, one question we must ask is who will be next if Taiwan falls? To me, Taiwan should never allow that scenario to happen. We are absolutely committed to defending ourselves from the onslaught of the Chinese expansionism. We know our responsibilities beyond our borders. We need to be resilient to show to the world that democracy is a better path for the mankind. My dear friends, now the democratic Taiwan is the David struggling with the authoritarian Chinese Goliath. Democracy will prevail and Taiwan will prevail. As the threat posed by China is becoming graver than ever, our relations with the United States are also growing stronger than ever as we are ready to commemorate the 40th anniversary of the Taiwan Relations Act, or TRA. Enacted on April 10, 1979, the TRA was born of the need to protect significant security and commercial interests between Taiwan and the United States in the wake of the change of diplomatic recognition from Taipei to Beijing. It has played an indispensable role in shaping American strategy in Asia and provided a reliable security umbrella that allowed Taiwan to blossom into one of the world leading free market democracies. The TRA has served as a guiding principle and a cornerstone for deep, robust, and comprehensive partnership between Taiwan and the United States. There is no better time to reinforce the special bond and build on our strong ties, undergirded by our shared values, as we celebrated four decades of enduring friendship. After President Tsai assumed office in May 2016, the U.S.-Taiwan partnership has become much stronger. The bipartisan support on the Capitol Hill has been phenomenal, as we see bills, legal clauses, and statements supporting Taiwan passed by the House or the Senate one after another. Significant progress has also been made in the area of security cooperation, as evidenced in multiple announcements of arms sale. In addition, we have received unprecedented U.S. support in Taiwan's international participation. On political exchanges, we have seen a record number of federal and state officials visiting Taiwan, including your very own Assistant Secretary, Marie Royce, who came to Taiwan for the dedication ceremony 
of the huge state-of-the-art new AIT complex, which is a concrete symbol of the rock-solid Taiwan-US relationship. To celebrate our 40 years of strong bond, my ministry has worked with the US counterparts to roll out a year-long campaign with the motto, Enduring Partnership. And we are prepared to showcase this relationship through the activities that highlight the cultural, educational, and historical ties through, uh, acti through, uh, between our two societies, as well as events that underscore our joint interests and values. For example, uh, I'm pleased to tell you that as we speak, Taiwan convenes a regional dialogue on religious freedom, the first ever regional forum following last year's ministerial event to advance religious freedom in Washington, D.C. Some of you probably noticed that U.S. officials, including Secretary Pompeo himself, now describe Taiwan as a reliable partner, a democratic success story, and a force for good in the world. I'm yet to see another country that enjoys such a high regard by the U.S. government, and Taiwan is damn proud of it. As the Trump administration carries out its strategy for Asia, Taiwan marches forward with our most vital partner in lockstep. And Taiwan, sus Taiwan stands as an ideal ally for like mighty countries in pursuit of free and open Indo-Pacific. Our indispensable relationship with the United States is the best example ever to chart the collaborative path for the entire Indo-Pacific and like-minded countries around the world. Despite China's mounting pressure to unjustly exclude Taiwan from international fora, to sever Taiwan's ties with our diplomatic allies, and to isolate Taiwan from regional trade blocks, it has never for one day stopped Taiwan from contributing to the world where we can and defending the liberal international order and universal values where we must. The best way to defend Taiwan, as President Tsai declared in her last year's National Day Address, is to make ourselves indispensable and irreplaceable to the world. This means that Taiwan must be ready and prepared to be more outward-facing and an able-bodied partner ready to do all the heavy lifting necessary to turn dreams into reality. And this is Taiwan's commitment to our value-based diplomacy with wholehearted open arms, embraces each and every like-minded partner to build a common future for a peaceful and prosperous, free and open Indo-Pacific in generations to come. Allow me to be blunt. Our warm power trumps the authoritarian sharp power. Taiwan has proactively reached out to our neighbors in the region via President Tsai's signature New South Bond policy the essence of this policy is to strengthen democratic institutions, collective security, commercial relationship, and people-to-people -people linkages across the region. We are also committed to supporting the development of countries in the Indo-Pacific region in ways that do not settle nations with debt and flood their markets with cheap products. We have set forth our Official Development Assistance, or ODA, to support infrastructure and development projects in countries across the region. This represents our uh, belief that Taiwan, with our expertise in, in transportation, logistics, and construction, can play a bigger role in the future development of the region. And just for your information, we are gradually building a partnership with the United States and Japan in this regard. And in addition to this, across the Blue Pacific, our agriculture and medical teams work day in and day out to improve the livelihood of people in some of the smallest states in the world, countries that might have been neglected by international community, but we are absolutely committed in supporting. On the front of value-based diplomacy, both our governments and civil societies are increasingly active in sharing Taiwan's soft power in the region and across the world. 
For example, both Taiwan and the United States have been working on the Global Cooperation and Training Framework, or GCTF, to contribute on issues ranging from women's empowerment, media literacy, public health, digital economy, environment protection, to humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. Furthermore, from supporting the mining efforts in the war-torn Syria, through our membership in the Global Coalition in Defeating ISIS, to providing humanitarian assistance to the displaced Venezuelans, to combating Ebola in Africa, we have thrived to be a powerful force for good in the world. To conclude, I would like to stress again, Taiwan is a frontline state defending democracy, freedom, and global rules-based order. We strive to strengthen our democracy, safeguard our freedom of press and freedom of speech, and shine brightly as a beacon of hope for many who aspire to breathe the air of freedom and democracy. At the historical juncture, where great power competition exacerbates and ideological battle looms, Taiwan has made its choice clear. We stand with the force of freedom and democracy. When we stand together, we stand stronger. Together we rise and together we resolve to be a force for good in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Foreign Minister, for your frank and illuminating speech. Uh, the Foreign Minister has agreed to take some questions. Uh, two of my colleagues have microphones, so please raise your hand and they will approach you with your question. And please make your question a question and not a statement. Thank you. Uh, Minister Wu, welcome to Los Angeles again. Thank you. It was uh, 11 years ago you came here as an ambassador to Washington, D.C. from Taiwan. Welcome back. Thank you. Uh, after the last year la elections in November, uh, DDP suffered a very severe setback. As a result, uh, some of the major cities was managed by opposition party right now. Their, their China policy are quite different from DDP. As a result, the observer from uh, your friends around the world are concerned, will there be any Boris Yeltsin effect, which happened in 1990, which may undermine President Tsai's foreign policy and cross-trade relationship? You just mentioned we have to unite it and be strong to face the challenge. Can you tell us how Taiwan is going to unite themselves when the house is in such a divide? Appreciate your answer. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that question. Uh, you mentioned about me coming to uh, LA. I, I don't know how many times I've been back to LA, and I always have such a joy uh, in coming, to, uh, coming back to LA. And I love uh, the welcome. Uh, of friends in uh, Los Angeles, and it's a promise that I will keep coming back. Uh, indeed, we suffered a defeat in the November local election last year. Uh, and uh, in the uh, local election last year, uh, it was a local election, and we made it to be local. And therefore, national policies were not debated. Uh, and I would hate to uh, uh, draw the conclusion, as some people would, uh, that uh, it has an implication on cross-rate uh, relations. But since it's a local election, so people did not uh, debate on uh, the cross-rate policy, on the national policies. Uh, and therefore, uh, I tend to see it as a temporary setback for the DPP. Uh, and if you look at what uh, President Xi Jinping said on January the 2nd and the response from President Tsai, when Taiwan is affected by the other side of the Taiwan Strait, we stand up and rebut, and we rebut in a very serious manner. And therefore, you can see the public support for the president or for this government has significantly increased, and the increase is very fast. And therefore, when election rolls along, I'm sure 
people are going to debate the national policies and cross-strait policies, foreign policies. And I think uh, the record of the DPP government stands for public test in this regard. Uh, as I said to some friends last night, uh, our relations with the United States has uh, been the strongest in the last couple of years. And I think people in Taiwan feel that. And our relations with Japan, with many other like-minded countries, is also very strong. And I think people understand that. They know that. And I think they are going to support that. Uh, and therefore, when the election uh, for uh, January next year rolls along, I'm sure you will see much more interesting uh, debate on the national policies or on cross trade policies. And when people compare uh, the uh, policies proposed by uh, major candidates, uh, I can tell you, we still very uh, confident. We are still very confident uh, that we are going to win the national elections again. Hi, Dr. Wu. My name is Scott Macbeth. I'm really impressed by how you kept packed so much info in such a short amount of time and very interesting information. Thank you. What concrete steps would you like to see the United States take in the near future, let's say over the next year or two, in regards to relations with Taiwan? That's a short question, but that's a good question. At the same time, it's a very complicated question for me to answer. Uh, I've been working on Taiwan-U.S. relations for quite a few years, uh, beginning from the first DPP administration uh, in uh, 2006, 2007, and 2008. And uh, I'm still working on Taiwan-US relations when we were in opposition. I was a DPP Secretary General uh, in conjunction with a DPP representative to Washington, D.C. And after we came back, I served as a National Security Advisor uh, and the Presidential Secretary General and now the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Our relations with the United States has always been the most important relations for Taiwan in Taiwan's international dealings. And we always look for a comprehensive type of development in Taiwan and the United States. Uh, but I have to be very frank, the relations are already very good. But if, you know, uh, for somebody who's been working on the Taiwan-US relations for a long time, I can certainly see that there's still room to grow. For instance, in the area of economic relations between Taiwan and the United States, it's already been very good already. Uh, just give you a couple of examples. Uh, when uh, the United States is organizing the Select USA uh, program every June, Taiwan almost always has the largest delegation to visit Washington, D.C. and different states. Uh, in the year before, it will be the largest delegation, if not for China. Realize that Taiwan is going to be the largest de delegation, so they added about 50 people at the very last moment. And last year, uh, we are the largest delegation, and that shows how interested it, Taiwan is in forming economic relations with the United States. And uh, we procured uh, $20 billion uh, worth of LNG from the United States, and I heard that uh, some very senior uh, government official passed that on to uh, President Trump. And uh, it came back to us that President Trump was very happy uh, hearing that uh, we signed a contract on LNG. But he turned around and says that, how about some more soybeans? And we did buy more soybeans, more soybeans than we can consume in Taiwan. But we are very happy about that. Uh, and uh, that is you know, the spirit of economic relations between Taiwan and the United States. So we, and we have so much investment in the United States, helping creating job uh, opportunities. Uh, but we are not uh, satisfied with that. We hope Taiwan and the United States can have an FTA relations with each other. That is the way to bind the two economies together. And in the area of uh, security relations, I have to admit that it's already been very good. But we're constantly thinking about how to improve the security relations between the two sides. You know, for example, if uh, the two countries can have more exercises together, that will strengthen our uh, security uh, ability, our ability to be able to defend ourselves. So we're constantly thinking about uh, that regard. And about the political relations, I have to admit, again, you know, the political relations are already being uh, very good, uh, but there are still some barriers. Uh, for example, I'm still not yet uh, able to visit Washington, D.C., and our president can only transit through uh, 
the United States, but not visit the United States. And therefore, these are the things that we need to uh, discuss very closely with each other in order to achieve a better relations between the two sides. So these are some of the things that I can think of, and we'll continue to work very hard to make sure that Taiwan's relations with the United States remains very strong, and even stronger in the future. Thank you, Minister Wu. Um, I'm Derek Roseman with Rand Corporation. Quick question for you. Um, <clears throat> so, unfortunately, Taiwan, as we all know, Taiwan has lost five diplomatic allies since the Tsai administration has come into office. Um, and China is unfortunately able to woo a lot of these countries away, especially now with, with billions of dollars in, through the Belt and Road Initiative. In listening to your um, it, to your talk today, it sounds like Taiwan is kind of trying to transition more to a values-based diplomatic approach, and you also mentioned the very strong relationship that the that Taiwan now has with the United States. So is it fair to say that the balance is kind of shifting? It's not as much the number of remaining diplomatic allies, it's more kind of the, the other things that Taiwan can provide to the global community? Thank you. Thank you, that's a very good question. And that's the issue that we debate in Taiwan internally. Uh, but I can tell you in a very frank way that diplomatic allies are very important for Taiwan. And we're trying to safeguard each and every of our diplomatic allies. And we will work relentlessly to make sure that the diplomatic allies remain in very good relations with Taiwan. And it's not just that uh, we have diplomatic allies so that they can speak out on behalf of Taiwan. I think that's also showing that Taiwan can help the international society in a Taiwan model. If you check around with our diplomatic allies, I think they welcome Taiwan's cooperation more than any other country because Taiwan's cooperation project with them is directly benefiting their people. Uh, I was in PIF, the Pacific Island Forum, uh, last summer. And uh, the uh, diplomatic allies over there uh, told me that even though uh, the aid coming from the European countries are much bigger, but they appreciate the Taiwan model of assistance to them because Taiwan's model is directly working with their people to make sure that the benefit is going to the individual peoples directly. So, you know, this is a way uh, we try to do it. And of course, uh, Taiwan has been excluded from international fora, uh, and we need our diplomatic allies to speak out in a very loud way uh, in support of Taiwan's international participation. And every one of our uh, diplomatic allies have been doing that, and we appreciate that very much, and we don't want the numbers to dwindle further. Uh, but at the same time, we also try to strengthen our relations with the like-minded countries. And we have been uh, working very hard in the, our relations with the United States, Australia, Japan, uh, Korea, or uh, European countries. And the reason is because we believe that Taiwan has something to contribute. Uh, give you an example. Uh, on the issue of North Korea, uh, when the UN passed the resolution sanctioning North Korea, Taiwan is not a member of the United Nations it's going to be extremely difficult for Taiwan to become a member of the United Nations. But we still work with the international community in sanctioning against uh, North Korea. And when we uh, spoke with the American officials in Taiwan, uh, we told them that, uh, hey, Taiwan can do more. We will cut off our trade relations totally with North Korea. And we've done that. And I think we want the appreciation of the United States and many other countries in the region. Uh, the uh, uh, U.S. former secretary, uh, ambassador to the U.N. even spoke publicly about Taiwan's contribution to the uh, North Korean issue. And just give you uh, a new example. On the issue of Venezuela, uh, I'm sure the uh, World, Affairs World Affairs Council, L.A., is going to host uh, a new round on uh, Venezuela. Uh, and uh, when we heard and discuss it in the discussion with the American officials, uh, the U.S. government thinks that Taiwan might be able to move, make some contribution uh, to help the uh, people displaced uh, by uh, the turmoil. And we say yes right away. We not only made contributions to uh, the humanitarian needs of the Venezuelans, uh, we also came out uh, to support 
the people of uh, Venezuela in rebuilding their democracy. And I think Taiwan is the first country in Asia to do that. And we heard that uh, President Guaido and his camp appreciate that very much. And he came back to us and asked for something else. You know, for example, uh, other than uh, the uh, half a million dollars uh, humanitarian assistance, they also asked Taiwan to provide three trucks uh, to transport uh, humanitarian goods from uh, Colombia to Venezuela. And we did it right away. We provided the trucks within three days, and they knew it. They appreciated it very much. And when they think that uh, maybe Taiwan can be a leverage to encourage Japan or uh, other countries in uh, the region to come out and support Venezuela, and we did. I personally spoke with some of the ambassadors in Taipei, and they agreed to trans transmit uh, those messages back home. And uh, we, you, you can see that some of uh, other governments in the region came out in a very strong way to support President Guaido, and that's Taiwan. That's Taiwan's contribution to the international community. And the reason why Taiwan is willing to contribute to the international community, because we know that we are not alone. There are so many like mighty countries that are willing to help Taiwan, to work together with Taiwan, and we'll continue to make contributions. Thank you, Ambassador Xu, for such a very inspiring talk. On behalf of the people and the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, I want to take this opportunity to thank you for the assistance over the past 30 years. Or over the past 30 years. We appreciate the relationship, and we hope it will continue. And I think the thing that's more unique about our relationship is like a people-to-people -people relationship. And from my perspective, there seem to be no ties associated. That's a, a, a genuine relationship, people to people. And I want to thank you for that support, and I hope it will continue over the years. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, appreciate it. And St. Vincent and Grenadine and Belize and Guatemala and many other of our diplomatic allies, uh, not only in this region, but also in the Pacific, continue to support Taiwan's international participation. And that is heartfelt. And that is what we need. Thank you. My name is Carl Dickerson. I'm the uh, vice chairman of uh, Town Hall of Los Angeles. And my question is this. In a recent issue of The Economist, uh, it stated in one of their leading articles that the population in Africa will exceed that of China uh, by the year 2025. And my uh, frequent visits to Africa and other countries, I've noticed that the mainland China has a significant uh, uh, presence in Africa. And I was wondering whether or not Taiwan uh, as a country would like to, or uh, maybe perhaps you could explain your attitude about uh, towards Africa in terms of what values you could bring to the continent and what uh, values you feel that uh, they could uh, bring to Taiwan in terms of natural resources. Thank you. Uh, appreciate it very much for the question. Uh, we only have a diplomatic ally. Uh, in the continent of uh, Africa, and that is Eswatini. Uh, we tried uh, to expand our operation, especially economic operation, uh, in the continent of uh, Africa, uh, and we have uh, quite a few businessmen actually are doing business in Africa. And what we have been planning, uh, but we haven't come to the fruition yet, is to think about Taiwan way of uh, cooperation with other countries who are interested in uh, their operation in Africa. You know, for example, uh, the United States, uh, Japan, uh, India, uh, who think that uh, they have a stake in uh, Africa as well. And what we see in Africa is that China is coming in with uh, investments, uh, with their political influence, and uh, very often uh, come into Africa uh, to corrupt the uh, local uh, government officials, and that is something that uh, many people have already uh, been discussing about. And we have seen articles after articles of China's investment in Africa. 
not to the benefit of the people in Africa, but to the benefit of the uh, ruling elites. Uh, for instance, when China says that I will uh, make an investment in one major project, they bring their own workers into the country. They bring their own material into the country. And therefore, the people over there were not benefited. Um, but I think the Taiwan way of uh, doing business or making investment is very different. And I think the Indian way of doing it is also very different. The Japanese way of doing it is also very different. And I think the Japanese uh, JPEG, as well as uh, American uh, OPEC, uh, are already aligned with each other. And Taiwan has started a working relationship with these two major uh, organizations. And when time rolls along, Taiwan is very willing to uh, make investment or to uh, get involved in the uh, projects, not only in our own region, but also in Africa. But it would take a little bit more time, and we would need to discuss with uh, like-minded countries like the United States or Japan or other countries who have a say in uh, the continuing prosperity of Africa. Thank you, Mr. Wu. My name is Wendy Yang. Um, I, I think we all, I'm, uh, used to be with DPP. I'm still with DPP as well. And um, uh, oh, yesterday, Wendy. hi. <laughs> so yesterday, can I see you from here? Oh, sorry. So yesterday, uh, several of us Taiwanese Americans joined our Tibetan friends at the Chinese consulates to remember the Tibetan National Uprising Day from six years ago. And we know that the day before in Taiwan, a similar events uh, also took place in Taipei. Yes. And um, your, su your um, successor in DPP also joined uh, the event as well. So um, as we know, Decades ago, when China and Tibet entered the 17-point agreement, and we all know what happened to Tibet afterward, and then continue, uh, we, st we still continue to see more oppression within Tibet in Xinjiang, and, the, and then we also hear from our friends from Uyghur how the con concentration camps are taking place. And even with all of that, there are still some individuals, actually some the, uh, the, the opposition party in Taiwan are still trying to advocate a peace agreement with China. Um, I was wondering how can we help them see the danger um, getting so close with China. A, a country like that, they're not going to, whatever they sign, they're really not going to um, go uh, with the, uh, according to the peace treaty. Okay, thank you, Wendy, for that question. Uh, as I said a little bit earlier, uh, Taiwan uh, is convening a regional forum on the religious freedom. And you probably noticed from uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, Twitter account uh, yesterday that we tweeted about uh, the uh, rights of the people in Xinjiang and Tibet and also the rights of the Catholics in China. And we care about their rights. Uh, and we'll continue to advocate their rights uh, for freedom, for religious freedom and uh, the freedom from persecution based on race or religion. Uh, and I think the uh, issue that you mentioned about uh, peace agreement in between Taiwan and China is something for us to think very seriously about. Think very seriously about not in the sense that uh, peace agreement is a good thing. Uh, let's remember what happened in Tibet. They signed a 17-point agreement with each other. But that's like a contract to invite the Chinese for further bloodshed in Tibet and to control the entire population in a way that we don't want to see. And I think uh, that is something for us to learn from. Uh, if there's going to be a peace in between Taiwan and China, I think that the easiest way, and there's the only way for the peace to be agreed, is for China to renounce the use of force against Taiwan, and then we will have peace. There's no agreement needed. And I think we can take uh, one step or two steps a little bit further on the idea of peace agreement in between Taiwan and China. Uh, in the uh, older days, uh, when the Chinese government talking about the resolution in between Taiwan and China, they're talking about Taiwan must accept 
the precondition of one China principle. And when they say one China principle, means Taiwan is part of China. And the next step uh, for the resolution of, uh, of uh, um, differences in between the two is for Taiwan and China to enter into a ceasefire or a cease of a ceasing uh, hostility in between the two sides. And when they say that ending the hostility in between Taiwan and China is to recognize that the current situation is a prolongment of civil war. And uh, when the uh, ceasefire or ending the hostility is done, then there will be a peace agreement. And I think peace agreement is to legalize the civil war ending situation. And when we sign that, that means Taiwan recognizes that Taiwan is already part of China. And I don't think that is acceptable to the people in Taiwan. Uh, for many of those who have chances to visit Taiwan, uh, I said it again and again, and I'll do it again over here. We have a presidential election. Uh, sometimes, you know, we elect somebody I don't like, but at least, you know, <laughs> he's publicly elected. And he's our president, he represents Taiwan. And we also have a parliament in Taiwan. And the parliament is also publicly elected. And I don't, to be very frank, I don't like the performance of our parliament, but it's a democratically elected parliament anyway. And also represent the public opinion in Taiwan. And we also have military, we have independent monetary system, and we also have Ministry of Foreign Affairs. That's me, <laughs> right? And we issue visa and we issue passport. So when you put all this together, Taiwan is a country. There's no bones about it. And I think people are so much used to the situation that we are not run by other countries. People are very happy with the way it is. And that is the reason why we continue to say that we will maintain the status quo. And if we want to maintain the status quo, peace agreement is not an option. Thank you, Foreign Minister, for your frank and informative speech, for taking this many questions and answering them, frankly. I also want to thank Madame Wu for visiting with us today. Please know that any time you'd like to come back to Los Angeles, you have a podium at the Council, and we'd like to have you back in the future. Thank you very much. The meeting is adjourned.